Hi, I'm Rachel Maddow from MSNBC. Thanks for watching the transcript. This week, Jasmine and I had the privilege of sitting down with journalism legend and star of MSNBC's The Rachel Maddow Show, Rachel Maddow. She recently released her book Prequel, An American Fight Against Fascism, which looks into the battle to protect American democracy throughout history. We asked her about Prequel, her career, and the state of journalism today. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you got your career started here in Western Mass. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how that like influenced your career as a whole? And Hmm. I'm not much of a planner, so it wasn't like I set out to start here and then move here and then move here. It just kind of worked out that way. But I ended up um, going to graduate school in England. I moved here because my scholarship ran out before my doctorate was done. And so I needed to live somewhere cheap um, with friends where I could do odd jobs while finishing my dissertation. And so I started doing that here. One of the odd jobs that I took was at a local radio station in Holyoke. And that, um, I did that for a year. And then I got my dissertation, succeeded. And then 9-11 happened. And oh. I, wanted, I realized like I wanted to get back on the air. I wanted to be doing news. And so I started at a, another station here in Northampton, the River, WRSI, and did the morning show there. And then a local, uh, a, a, a national um, liberal talk radio network started in New York called Air America. And they hired me, and that's how I got to New York, and everything unspooled from there. But the whole time um, that I've been on that part of my career, I've lived here. So if, I've been in New York some of the time, but mostly I've been here the whole time. What has been your experience being a woman in journalism, and like, what advice would you have for women in journalism? Well, I've never been anything other than a woman in journalism, <laughs> so I, can't, I don't have any compare and contrast evidence for you. Um, I do think that particularly because television is a very visual medium, that it's a very gendered medium, very sort of rigidly gendered medium. Um, and, you know, I mean, you can, you can mess with that in all sorts of different ways, depending on who you are, but it just, it creates the environment in which you operate. In, in journalism more broadly, it's obviously a, a gendered space as well, but um, I think that, you know, like this book, for example, that I'm, I'm working on now, it's, um, it goes back to the 30s and the 40s, and there's a lot of really great female journalists, role models even from them, from then. So we've got decades of evidence of women succeeding in journalism. I think the only advice that I would give is something that I do tell young women in the field, um, which is not, not a good news story, but I, I tell them that you know, watch your emotions, your display of emotion in the, in the work environment, um, because in a male-dominated environment, people are less tolerant of being able to um, see women's emotions. Like, they, get, they tend to misinterpret them. And so it doesn't mean you can't be a whole person, but you need to be cognizant of the fact that men get away with a lot more emotional range than women do in a professional context. And I hope someday that changes, but right now it hasn't. Yeah. So in like pop culture, for instance, like you've been impersonated on SNL and appeared in like on The Simpsons and stuff like that. How has that affected your professional career? Um, like being on The Simpsons is the greatest thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like whatever else I do, that's kind of, you know, that will always be true. It's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I love that stuff and like doing cameos and movies and uh, TV shows and stuff. I was the uh, voice of a... Um, a sort of sinister radio personality in the Batwoman show for a while. Like, I love that stuff. I'm terrible at it. I can't act at all. But, um, but I absolutely love that stuff. And when you end up with people referencing you in a cultural, cultural um, way, like the SNL stuff, it's, a, it's very flattering, right? Even if it's an unflattering portrayal, <laughs> it is flattering that they are confident that if they reference you, their audience will know who they're talking about. Like, oh, you're kidding. People watching SNL will know that the person they're making fun of is me. It's, um, I try to, I try to be um, thick-skinned about it and not mind too much and just be flattered by it. I saw you in a Red, White, World of Big Fan. Yes. yes. So. <laughs> so I, oh, so, okay. Can I talk about Red, White, yeah, World? Yeah. So, you know, Joy Reid is in it too. Um, and Joy saw it before I did. I had completely forgotten that I had done it because it was a long time between when we recorded it and when it ended up in the show. And so Joy called me and was like, girl, we are in this. It is amazing. You have to watch it. And the first time that I came on in the movie, 
And then it's like, I came on once and then Joy came on once and I thought that was it. And then in the back half of the movie, like I played this really important part in the plot. I had no idea. Yeah. You could have totally knocked me over. It was fantastic. I loved that. I loved it. Do you see a greater amount of like censorship in today's media than like the start of like your career? No. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, no. I, I think there is an external perception of the news media, particularly TV news, where there's like a company or like a corporate interest that's telling us what we can cover and what we can't. And that's just not true. Um, I have editorial freedom to cover what I want um, and to not cover stories that I don't want to cover, and I have editorial freedom to cover them the way I want to. Um, the only um, sort of asterisk on that is that uh, MSNBC, where I work, is part of the NBC News umbrella. And so that means that we are bound by NBC News rules and standards for journalism, mm -hmm. which is a form of restriction that I actually totally welcome because it makes us be rigorous. And it makes, you know, we have, we have rules in terms of sourcing. Uh, we have rules in terms of, you know, contacting people for comment. We have rules in terms of, um, you know, what, what type of material we accept from people and, and how, we, how we are transparent with our audience about it. So that's really the only restriction that we have, but that's a positive restriction because it makes us make sure that we're doing things in a, in a, rigorous, and, um, a rigorous way with, with integrity. Um, do you have any fears about the future of journalism now that AI is starting to become a factor in, like, coverage and all that? Yeah, I was thinking about that today. I was, um, I was on um, the uh, Late Show with Stephen Colbert last yes, night, which is, <laughs> which is really nice. It's awesome. And the way those things work, I mean, for better or for worse, if you appear on a late night show and you talk about the news, it often gets picked up as a news story the next yeah. day, right? Because it's like in, it's not a place where they always do news. And so sometimes if a news person goes. So I was checking today to see, like, oh, did that get picked up anywhere? And one of the articles that popped up was very clearly written by AI. Wow. It was just, it was like, I mean, it just made me realize, like, this is very obviously an AI-generated article. How long will it be before we can't tell that it is an AI-generated article? Mm -hmm. um, and I am concerned because, you know, to that same point that I was just making about NBC News rules and standards, I mean, we're, we don't answer to a bot, you know, and we don't answer to a corporate executive who wants us to sell certain types of advertising. Like, we, we answer to professional editors who are keeping us honest and keeping us on the right side of professional journalism. And if it's just going to be robots writing stuff, there's that... There's, there's no professional constraint on that in terms of how responsible it is. And I just think that th th there's a real chance that spirals really quickly to people not believing any news at all. What type of advice would you give like students starting out in journalism, like students like Do you us? know any? <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I would say thank you. I mean, mm -hmm. being a journalist is a noble thing. Your country needs you. Um, the business model for what journalism is going to be as you guys, you know, get into your careers. I can't tell you what it's going to be like. I don't know what type of journalistic institutions you'll be working for or who you'll be answering to or what the pay is like. And I know that that form of uncertainty makes it feel, must make it feel sort of risky to set out um, at this point in American history with that being your career goal. But we are going to need people who are trained how to do this professionally and responsibly, um, we're going to need that forever. Yeah. And the country is really toying with the idea of not being a democracy anymore. Um, but if we are going to stay a democracy, that means that people need to know true things about what's going on in the world. And journalism is the only way we get that about contemporary events. And so mostly I would say thank you. and. Um, be resilient. Stick with it. What was your biggest inspiration for writing? So the way that I um, teach myself stuff, the way that I learn stuff is that, and this is just like a quirk of how my brain works, yeah. I, um, I tend to try to find the origin story. I try to go back to the beginning. Um, and so I was working on contemporary news stuff around um, what's going on in the Republican Party with this 
sort of anti-democratic impulse that I think is happening in Republican electoral politics. And I was interested in the fact that simultaneously we are also seeing neo-Nazism and Holocaust denial really spike. And before I talked about that in a contemporary context, I wanted to understand more about whether or not this was new or whether there were other instances in US history where you saw those two things happening at once, a real ultra-right turn in electoral politics and the neo-Nazi and Holocaust-denying anti-Semitic right also ascending. And in looking at that, I ended up in this story in the 40s that I had never heard before. Um, I mean, I knew that there were some pro-Nazi people and pro-fascist people in the U.S. before World War II. I was aware of that. I was not aware that 29 of them were put on trial for sedition. Um, and it was the Great Sedition Trials, what they called it, and it was front page news all over the country. And the way that trial ended is the judge croaked. The judge died in the middle of it, and they all got away. And once I found that story, I was like, I, uh, uh, I know this was for a news purpose, is why, which is why I started looking at this stuff, but I think I need to tell this story. It just yeah. really blew me away. And then the more I learned about it, the more I realized that it might be actually quite a helpful story uh, in terms of people thinking about um, America's prior experiences with the ultra right. What type of like extensive research went into this book? Like I know there's like a bunch of like different characters and then like a bunch of different stories that you were telling in this book. Mm -hmm. So the research is super fun. Um, the hard part is knowing when to stop researching and start writing. Um, I think that's true, you know, for research papers and research projects of all kinds. But in, in this case, the thing that was really interesting is that, you guys know the difference between primary source and secondary sources? Yeah. yeah. So the primary source stuff was, was exactly what you'd expect. There was a trial transcript. There are papers of some of the people that are involved that are all like stashed at various college libraries and stuff and archives. Primary source material, uh, newspapers, everything's right there. Secondary source material, people writing about it, there's almost nothing. Like there's a little bit of academic stuff on it from decades ago. But even that, it's interesting that the academic writing about it is like really dismissive, like, oh, this was no big deal. Don't bother looking at this. <laughs> it's really weird. And then I realized that the, there was a trove of secondary source material that wasn't in an obvious place, which was um, neo-Nazis and fascists writing about it. Because they are very proud of this time period because their guys in the late 30s and 40s were really influential and plotting to take over the country and connected to the most influential people in politics. And, I mean, all the reasons I wanted to tell this, they want to tell it because they're so proud of it. But they're the only ones who have written this history and they wrote it in a, um, you know, a self-exculpatory way. And I realized, oh, this might be a contribution. I'm going to write a, my own history of this that is not designed to make the fascists look good, <laughs> which is what all of those guys were doing. So the, the, the research ended up being some of what you'd expect, but there were some real surprises. So, and finally, uh, while, while writing your book, how did you maintain your essential theme of democracy and fascism while gathering different stories from so many different places? That is the fun part and the hard part, right? Is it's You have to stop yourself from just infinitely doing research and you have to not get so buried in the material that you lose track of the story, of the story that you're trying to tell. And you have to be flexible as you learn new stuff. You have to be willing to change the story. You have to be willing to you know, tweak the plot to make it go in different directions, to make it reflect what's true and what you've been able to find in your research. But that's the soul of it. That's the art. That's what makes it both hard and fun. Um, yeah, but there's no, there's no magic to it. There's no trick. You just got to do it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. I really appreciate you guys. This is really fun. Thanks. Thanks. Good luck. Uh, before you go, Thank can you. we shake? Thanks so much for watching. A huge thank you to Rachel Maddow, her team, and the Academy of Music for making this interview possible. See you next week.